of the Greater Good Gathering, which is co-sponsored by the School of International and Public Affairs and the Academy of Political Science. And um, yesterday, I know, was an extraordinary day, and I'm expecting today to be equally wonderful. I want to just take a moment to uh, thank Eric Schnur, who's in the back and never gets thanked. It's his brainchild. <laughs> And he really brought this to us and gave us an opportunity to partner with him. And uh, we're grateful. This is an extraordinary feat that you've uh, pulled off here with a lot of assistance, but we thank you personally for bringing it to Columbia and FICO. <laughs> I, I also want to especially thank my dean, who's here this morning, Mary Zeno, who really made this happen without her leadership and her vision, uh, we wouldn't be really thinking about the most important issues that are facing our country, our city, and our nation, and the globe um, right here at FICA at Columbia. She's been somebody who's been thinking about technology and the public good for a long time before it became something chic and popular. And we're very grateful for your leadership on this, Mary. And thank you make this possible. Um, I won't start calling out names. I, I, Mayor Dinkins taught me that when you start doing that, you insult more people than you compliment. Um, so, but I, I know who you are, and I'm thanking you all. These things don't happen without our staff and students. Um, we're going to kick off this morning uh, with the panel that I'm moderating. I'm Esther Fuchs. I'm a professor here at FIFA. Uh, and I run the Urban and Social Policy Program. Our panel is called Community Engagement, Personal Data, and Smart City Solutions for the Urban Streetscape, and I'd like to invite the panelists up uh, to our chairs and begin. You're probably, or you may not be, but you might be wondering uh, where the title of this panel came from. It certainly has a lot of uh, words in it for a title of a panel. Community engagement. Is there a mic? Yes. I'm sitting on it. I don't usually use a mic because my voice carries, or I hope it does. Okay, I'll start again. You're probably wondering why this panel has such a long title and so many words in it. Community engagement, personal data, smart city solutions, and the urban streetscape. So obviously, we on this panel realize that these are interconnected terms in a way that maybe some of you have not even thought about. But I had the good fortune to be deeply immersed in a fascinating NSF proposal, National Science Foundation proposal, with the Columbia Engineering School and the Harlem community. And this convinced me of the importance of this panel this morning. The work of that project involves a partnership between universities, communities, businesses, and government. And of course, those are all of the elements of partnership that you could possibly think of, right? And the challenge for us was developing a proposal for the, for the national government. Uh, I don't think that the NSF has been cut yet for uh, the Engineering Research Center proposals. I hope not. Um, oh, that was a political comment, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I can't help it. The proposal we were involved in is, was for an engineering research center. And something changed in the way we began to think about 
these kinds of research centers. The university traditionally has been involved in a lot of obviously pure science research, which still is, of course, very important. But the center we were proposing would create applications that ultimately had to produce a societal benefit. So one of the great things about being at Columbia University is you get to interact with all kinds of very interesting, smart people from different parts of uh, the planet in many ways. And um, I had the good fortune to work earlier with, with some engineers on a trash project, and also with Barbara, on a trash project for the Department of Environmental Protection. And when the word societal benefit came up, some of my colleagues said, call Esther. She does public policy. She thinks about the social good. I, I don't mean to upset anybody in this room, but not everybody who does public policy thinks about the public good. So we have to realize that that requires some real discipline as well as forethought if the work you're going to do is actually going to focus on the public good or some societal benefit. And so in the course of this project, we decided to uh, focus on designing applications, and I say we, obviously I did not and will not be designing <laughs> applications, but I have Kathy here from the engineering school who does this work in many contexts, so uh, I'm not so worried about talking about that aspect of the science. But I learned a lot about that, which tells me that we all need to know the different pieces of the puzzle. So we were focusing on designing applications that could solve real streetscape problems in cities. And we decided to focus on the streetscape because that is really where people interact and where most of the things that we worry about and that we need um, have, to be, have to be provided by government. And so the purpose in the end would also be to to create potentially profit for businesses who developed applications, but also to produce something of public benefit at the same time. And very importantly, these don't have to be mutually exclusive. So ultimately, why is this important in my view? Our borough president in Manhattan, Gail Brewer, I thought said something so profound. Whoever controls the streets the sidewalks and plazas controls the 21st century city. And I think that's exactly correct. And you don't have to, you know, is all you have to do now is, of course, think about Amazon, who, you know, literally has taken over our, our streets with a delivery system that clogs our traffic, that, you know, we didn't really have much say in whether, how we wanted to regulate this. It came, and we still haven't figured it out. So something very small turns into something enormous, which really impacts the quality of all of our lives. So, you know, whether it's cities using sensors to manage traffic, to ensure trash bins don't overflow, this is one of our favorites, <laughs> help handicap and elderly cross the street safely, or even predict fires, we need to ensure that whatever technology we're bringing to the streetscape is the result of an inclusive process. And our panel represents, I think, everyone that needs to be at the table if we are to make technological innovations in our cities that ensure privacy and ethical security and also benefit our communities. So it's my pleasure to introduce the, our panelists, and then we'll begin the conversation. And I'll just go down the line here. I'm beginning with Barbara Askins. Barbara is the president and the CEO of the 125th Street Business Improvement District in Upper Manhattan. That's Harlem, for those of you who come from, I don't know where you could come from and not know that, but. Um, <laughs> I'm just playing it safe, Harlem. <laughs> okay. And um, she is a specialist on transportation, env environment, 
environmental and facility planning projects and has worked in cities and shared the best practices of her business improvement district all across the globe. And um, we have been partners on many projects. We're doing a capstone workshop at SEPA this semester uh, for the 125th Street bid, which Barbara designed. And we're, we're always very excited to work with you, Barbara. And, and we're grateful uh, for your mentorship of our students and for your partnership. And next to Barbara is uh, Kathleen McEwen. And many of you here uh, at Columbia know Kathy. She's the Henry and Gertrude Rothschild Professor of Computer Science and the founding director of the Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering at Columbia. She's a specialist in artificial intelligence, AI. And um, she's kind of responsible for me kind of figuring out that I love engineers. Um, <laughs> and sh we're really grateful for you uh, participating in this project this morning. And next to Kathy is Robin Chase, who, I've, who I just met today, but know your book and know what you've done, and uh, you, know, you blow us all away, frankly, in uh, the kinds of creativity that you've shown and your interest in the larger questions around sex technology. Robin is the co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar. <laughs> and she's the author of Peers, Inc., How People and Platforms Are Inventing the Collaborative Economy and Reinventing Capitalism. A uh, very important book. And of course, Zipcar has made our lives much more pleasant in this city, as you probably know. And of course, my friend, and thank you for coming uptown, Andrew. Andrew Razesh. <laughs> he is he's a civic and social entrepreneur. He's a technology strategist and the founder of a very important organization in New York which is being replicated all over the globe called Civic Hall. And he's going to tell you about Civic Hall so I won't go into detail, but I recommend that everybody visit C Civic Hall not at the same time but come and visit. It's in the Flatiron District in Manhattan, and it's really um, an extraordinary place. So I want to begin our conversation this morning with Kathy, because in many ways you have the broadest view of things and can help us set the stage for the discussion. There's so much confusion about smart cities and what, what they really are. And some people really have, as a consequence, become afraid of technology and how it'll affect them. And think that it's making decisions for them, essentially. And people are no longer making the decisions, even in the public policy arena. And really, as an engineer and a data scientist, and as I said, a specialist in AI, I'm asking you a big question here, and you can take it in any way you want. Explain to us, what are some of the opportunities that this can present in the smart city space? And, and what are the challenges as you see it as we're moving forward? Because the, you know, the train, I, that's an old metaphor, but um, maybe the zip car has left the station. And um, we're not going backwards on this. Okay, thank you, Esther, and thank you for asking me to be part of the panel. Um, so I thought about answering this question in, in, in terms of uh, first um, kind of definition of what could be a smart city. And I think of a smart city as a city in which uh, we have sensors of various types that can perceive the environment and respond to the environment in some ways uh, the same as humans do. Um, so it's best to think about this in terms of examples, and probably the simplest example is one which Esther already alluded to, where we have um, cameras on our traffic lights, which can help the community by determining, uh, especially for lights, this never happens in New York, but <laughs> for lights where you don't have any traffic for a long period of time, so it can automatically determine when to switch a light from green to red. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
Of course, uh, there are many sort of broader examples than that. We can have sensors on vehicles. So we might have sensors on bikes or cars or trucks, which may uh, sense motion and, for example, may detect uh, where there are potholes or where um, paths are difficult for bicyclists to travel on. And then this information can be sent back to a city to um, change what it does. And of course, we can go broader. A sm smart city can include um, buildings which have sensors in them and can automatically adjust heating depending on when they are more occupied and when they are less occupied. And then we can go even broader. We have um, cities that begin to install sensors on platforms around the city. Often this is things like street, street lights and um, they may contain a variety of different kinds of sensors, but one might be a camera which could um, watch and detect people on the street who are going by. Um, at this has been used for a long time to help prevent, uh, protect us for safety purposes. Um, we can use these to look back at um, who was around when a crime occurred. And then we can um, think of, of sensors that even in a broader sense, for example, uh, sensors um, that uh, can operate over text, so that can read and analyze uh, text, for example, posts that um, citizens make on social media platforms. And one kind of um, analysis that such sensors have done um, are, for example, to detect hate speech and can react in any different kind of way, for example, maybe uh, to suppress hate speech on a platform like Facebook. Um, you can imagine how it would be useful in that context. Um, it could, of course, be used by a city and any kind of platform that's being used for the community um, to communicate among each other, again, to detect inappropriate speech. Um, it can be used uh, by, um, it's been especially important, I think, for newspaper, news organizations where um, reporters are often targeted uh, when they report um, on things in a way that other people um, don't like. Um, so these are some ways that um, a smart city operates and can be helpful to us. Um, but we also know that uh, things can go wrong. Um, or the kinds of applications that we have can be sort of unanticipated. Um, this can happen when, um, because many of these algorithms that are trained to operate are, are uh, so let's take the streetscape um, sensor that would be part of a platform on the street, um, may be trained to recognize faces that as they go by, and we um, heard about China where they have um, face recognition of, of people on the street and um, can track who goes, who goes where at different points in time. So what can go wrong with this kind of application? Um, I, there are two kinds of things to think about. One is, um, what were the initial goals? Who, who is involved um, in setting it up? What kind of um, controls are there on the kind of applications we may have? And um, so in San Diego, for example, they have put up these uh, platforms with different sensors and they put it on a, on a platform that allows anybody to come in and build an app to make use of the sensors um, to carry out different, you know, to develop different kinds of applications. And this can be good because, um, you know, it allows a, what we could think of as a lot of brainstorming going on that uh, the city may not have thought of different sort of exciting things they could do with the data um, that everybody, 
you know, many people in the community may have considered. Um, but it also can be bad because there really is no control in that situation about how your data is being used and your privacy. <coughs> Another kind of problem that can arise is what is in what's called bias. So all of these algorithms that are trained to react based on the data are, are trained on data. And the kind of data that we <coughs> typically have um, comes from sort of mainstream, or well, that's not quite the right way to say it, but a narrow slice of society. Um, so for example, for hate speech, um, it's been determined that many of the algorithms that um, have been developed have been trained on speech by people like um, from the university, let's say, or people who write in the New York Times. And as a result, um, for uh, it's been noted that such hate speech algorithms are biased against speech uh, that uses an African-American dialect and can automatically classify some of these texts as hate, hate speech just when it comes from that dialect. So, so these are some of the things that we have to think about. Who's involved in designing these algorithms? Where does the data come from? And how can we guard against the kind of bias that um, might develop? Thanks, Kathy. That really sets the stage for our conversation and hopefully gives people a sense of what these applications do and how they use primarily sensor data. Um, there are other forms of data on the street um, uh, to actually solve real problems. Um, so that leads me to Robin. And uh, Robin, I think it would just be great for you to tell us about your experience developing the zip car and some of the challenges you faced and, and the challenges you see for cities moving forward. Thank you. Actually, reflecting on this question, the zip car is going to be 20 years old in June. So when I think about this starting point, um, what's fascinating to me is when I go find a zip car in June of 2000, it took me a long time to come up with the sentence, the zip car makes getting a car as easy, renting a car as easy to use as getting cash from an ATM. And, and maybe that sentence, because today, I would say, say, zip car makes using a car as easy as your, using your own. And why I'm making that distinction is in these 20 years, zip car was the lead on the larger urban movement of how do we substitute for and get rid of personal car ownership in dense urban areas. So if you think about car ownership, you do all sorts of types of trips. And to replace that car, you need to use many different modes. So we're moving from a monomodal society to a multimodal society. And Zipcar provides one aspect of that. And no, we don't compete with Uber and Lyft because I would never, ever take a Zipcar uptown. Why would I ever do that? I wouldn't <laughs> want to park and pay. So, so if we think about this substitute for all possible use cases for your personal car, you, you want to have all these different types of things. So just want to set that in, in your minds as I talk about the things that were really challenging for us. And those are examples of why things continue to be broken. broken. So we think about transportation regulators and governments think about transportation in these silos. Are you car rental? Are you a bus? Are you, you know, what, what exactly are you personal or are you perfect for commercial use? And so if I think about, think about this, one of Zipcar's first challenges were it was in the city of Boston where we launched, there was a convention center tax that was applied to car rental companies for every transaction, there was a $10 fee. And why was it applied to car rental companies? Because car rentals are used by out people outside of our city. No one in the city is going to ever argue about that. And that's how we're going to pay for the convention center. Zipcar was not car rental. It's by the hour and by the day. And it's used by people who live there. And so if you were going to charge $10 tax on top of an hourly rate, it wouldn't exist. But the city and the state had this, one had this idea, oh, we categorize things. And Zipcar is this brand new idea that didn't fit into those categories. Yeah. 
So I, I'm, I'm pointing that out because that's what's happened with Uber and Lyft. Are you a taxi or are you not a taxi? You define taxis in this special way, and we're gonna, and we're looking to say we're not taxis, we are in fact taxis. But if we think about these scooters, are they licensed to operate in your state or not licensed to operate in your state? Because each new thing has to fall into pre-existing categories. And so another example would be zoning for Zipcar. In some parts of Boston, in Cambridge, it was, it was a residential zoning, and then person who didn't want us to have a car parked in the, in the parking lot next door said, Zipcar is a business that's not allowed to operate in this residential zone place. <laughs> or should we have commercial license plates or personal license plates? If we had commercial license plates, Yahoo, I could park in every loading zone. But it's a bifurcation. If we had residential plates, could we park on street for free? I would like us to be able to. So just, again, each one of these things, how it, how, Regulation has preconceptions about innovation. Um, regarding GPS, and this is a data panel, I specifically did not put GPS into the technology built into every car because 20 years ago, I was using the principle, which should be the principle today, which is collect the least amount of information you need, and if you don't need it, don't collect it. Wow. And so we didn't need to know exactly where cars were. We did put GPS in the vehicles. And that really should be a principle that's applied today. Um, regard, regarding data, we were so early on that there actually the telecommunications companies didn't have data plans. They wanted to charge each car as if it were its own cell phone. So we were really on the front edge. Bringing this, oh, one last piece before I go there is that I also, way back in 2000, I would make quarterly reports to the city, and then as we expanded to the cities in which we were, in which I would tell them, hey, we've got this many cars that have replaced this many parking spaces used by this many members. So I would give them, and here's where they are, I would give them this data voluntarily because I wanted them to love us, and they should have loved us, and we do great things for cities. So fast forward to today, and I'm gonna bring it to today, we have this panoply of brand new innovations. Each one of these that's come out has a knockdown, drag out fight with cities, because of the way we have done our regulations. And, and if I were to talk about what types of policies should we have in the future, we should have policies that are related to what is the public good we are trying to address. So um, why is it that you're not allowed to, why is an e-scooter not considered legal in Philadelphia, in Pitts, Pennsylvania? Because they've categorized all things that are a certain weight at a certain speed are now called motorcycles and you have to have a driver's license. So e-scooter is, is considered something that you have to have a driver's license for. So we need to think, what is the public good? Are we worried about the weight of the vehicles? Are we worried about the speed? Are we worried about how many people you are carrying? So if you think about the future autonomous vehicles and who's a driver, who's not a driver, let's get to what is the core piece that we're trying to get at in order to make that, that regulations and then when the shared flying carpets come in, we don't have to reinvent a category. It would be, okay, you're lightweight, you're low speed, you're carrying people, so these are, these are regulations <laughs> that are applied to you. Right at this moment, there's a knockdown track, dry up fight in transportation around, the, as around privacy issues. So if we think about the digitization, I started with saying that in cities around the world because of climate change and sustainability and density, we really, really need to move people out of single occupancy, personally owned cars into more space efficient and sustainable vehicles. In Los Angeles, as a, as a pushback to their horror and anger of what happened with Uber bullying them or the rise of dockless bikes that they were terrified were gonna cover their city, they made this rule where they're asking for, in order to operate in their city, e-scooters, and shortly e-bikes, and then shortly car sharing, and then thereafter that all the taxis, and thereafter everything that can be put into this, but they're starting with scooters, is you may not operate in our city unless you give us real time tracing of that vehicle. So when you step on a, on a scooter, if you rent a scooter, the city is requiring you to, that the city is requiring Uber, Lyft, Jump, Bird, all of them to provide that real-time tracing of that individual vehicle. 
Mm. If you know anything about data privacy, it's 13 seconds before you can push that to Robin Chase got on here and went to the, I don't know what place I shouldn't have been going that now you know about. Um, the city, as I said, wants to do this for everything. And this is the first hit. And so coming back to why do you need that information? You can't just come to the word security or safety. Specifically, what kind of safety? Very specifically, what is it that you need to do? So I've learned this new word, and maybe my time is up. I'm I feel like there's this new word I want to introduce as an old word, which is dragnet. I never thought much about dragnet as a word. And dragnet is, I put my net out, and I'm catching a whole lot, and there's a couple things that I really wanted. And around data, in the transportation sector, we're casting dragnets everywhere for things. And in the city of New York, right now, with congestion pricing, we're doing exactly what I don't wish we would be doing, is installing more cameras and more things. And we're setting up a surveillance state where I'm taking a picture for one thing, that's all, but no, it can be in the background, that video feed can be reused for any number of things. So I'm really trying to alert you guys to, if we really want people to not use their personal cars and use shared transport, we are now saying for today, we're saying, if you take shared transport, you have zero privacy. But if you took your own car, in certain circumstances, you have privacy. And as you move towards congestion pricing and ultimately road pricing, in your own car, you also won't have any privacy. And so it, I thought it should be a civic conversation that people are understanding what's happening, what are the alternatives, and <coughs> what is it that we're gaining, what is it we're giving up. Thank you so much. I mean, that hits to the heart of the uh, some of the most important questions around this new technology and privacy. And it seems like we are constantly trying to figure out how to create a balance between something that may produce po something positive for the city at large and then compromise an individual's uh, personal privacy. And I want to I want to get back to that after we hear from the rest of our panelists, who I know will be addressing some of those points as well. Um, Barbara, yes. So I know that you've been at the cutting edge of bringing technology to the Harlem community, and you've managed to work with government, with business, and with Harlem residents, uh, where they trust you, uh, and they trust what you do. And I am really interested in you talking about some of the problems that you've been dealing with in, your co in the community uh, at the streetscape level uh, and the bid's been working on and the kinds of uh, partnerings that you've developed uh, in your uh, effort to create and use s uh, smart city solutions and how you've been dealing with the community engagement issue in a, in a very compelling, I think, way. That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> Always a okay. lot for Barbara. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here, and uh, I'm also excited to be a part of the team for the National Science Foundation grant because the things that Esther outlined in terms of what they were trying to do with this grant um, through technology is basically almost everything we have been doing on a streetscape level manually. So when you talk about um, tracking the number of potholes, we have been counting them manually since 1993. And we ha still have all our Excel sheets logging all of the potholes, you know, all of the lack of service deliveries, how long it takes the city to respond to the 311 calls, all of that stuff and why it don't work and eventually how you become a pest. So the National Science Grant, we hope to help us to move from this manual, slow, ineffective approach to trying to get people to address things to a more efficient way that we can also take that data and be able to use it. Right now, we have it, but the time it takes to just analyze it and use it and then educate the people who we work with, that we have it, and how they use it, and how they benefit, it just requires another staff person that we actually can't afford to do. So taking a step back, 
let me just describe what a business improvement district is. It's a private pu public partnership where the property owners agree to pay an additional tax above the real estate taxes voluntarily and it goes through like a ULERT process and you determine what your services are and then that voluntary tax become mandatory and if you don't pay it, it becomes under the same, it goes under the same um, enforcement as real estate taxes. Your property can get liens and all of that stuff, which brings forth um, more transparency and more accountability, which is why we feel business improvement districts work because you, you can't propose something and spend money for it and then show, don't show the results and then have the accountability that is transparent for everybody to see for that you're doing what was signed into law. So I think that some of those pieces can be applied, particularly because a lot of this stuff is about transparency and trust. So let me just start here and give you our programs quickly and some of the technological interventions we tried to do and which ones were successful. First, clean and safe is key to any business district. Without clean and safe, nothing else makes sense. And so with the clean, that's how we got to the trash studies. And so we're manually cleaning. We're, we're manually cleaning. And so of course everybody marketing and promotes and we talk about how we pick up 85,000 pounds of pedestrian litter, you know, every month which sounds great to the people we are accountable to, but the street's still dirty, and why do we have so much trash? Where is it coming from? How does it get removed? How do we use data to help with this? So we started off with this thing called a welcome app from London, because apparently, uh, from my exposure anyway, companies in London were starting to develop more uh, specialized apps around community needs with community input. And so we were able to custom apps around our operations instead of templates. And so I'm a firm believer of custom because Harlem, there is no other Harlem. So you can't sell me a template for Harlem. So as soon as somebody say template, I'm like, okay, tell me, you describe Harlem. That makes no sense, you know, to us. And so one of the key things is engagement and education. Engagement and education. So I've learned over the ways to start educating everybody in terms of what I do. So today, our state committee chair, Keith Wright, is in the audience. Oh. Hold up your hand. Uh, I reach out, I expose because the <laughs> because I have learned also that we need government. If you do not educate them, they're gonna do what they think needs to be done and it's all wrong for what we need to not only integrate into what we're doing, but maintain and manage and figure out a solution after what they gave us didn't work. So it's, it's always constantly, so as a manager, I had to learn how to start asking a lot of questions up front. And my biggest question here now is on dashboard. Every time you come to me and you tell me about a new product you develop, my first question is, do you have a dashboard? I already have six of them. I got six unintentionally. I don't need another one. Does your dashboard talk to other dashboards? If so, which one is it? Oh, we're working on that. Oh, you're working on it. How long is it going to take? <laughs> okay, three years later, you worked on it. You got it. Now there's a new product, and yours is obsolete. So now I'm in pushback, pushback, pushback all the time on operating, managing, training, retraining. There are no manuals, and you can't get anybody on the phone. So the next thing is Verizon, Fires, um, Spectrum. Uh, Vonage, all of these systems that everybody have to hook into and no one's giving you the impact to you when these large companies change what they're doing. What is 5G going to do to everything I've built? I have a website that's functioning, that's being driven by an app that's custom made and that means if it affects, I have no clue. Everything I have shuts down. And that's my communication to the community. That's my education. That's my retraining. 
It may be there, but we don't know where it is. We don't know how to find it. Plus, I'm supposed to be keeping 125th Street clean, safe, promoting real estate development, you know, strategies, how to deal with small businesses, integrated mix of retail with big box, small box. And then I found out I needed an IT company. Okay, you get an IT company, they charge you hopefully $874 if you can get a rate that low. What are they doing? They buy large packages of stuff that they put you on top of and then you have to put in a ticket to talk to someone. But they're charging you for maintaining. What are they maintaining? So I just shut everything down and I didn't talk to them for three months. And then they sent me a bill and I stopped paying, I stopped paying. So they called and they asked, well, we're maintaining you and you're not paying. You're not maintaining, I'm not on, everything is off. What are you maintaining? So, you know, it's like, so now we're in a lawsuit. So it's the challenge of going back and forth, back and forth with this technology. So here it comes to me and I can, I think I have the list. What technological interventions do I need to, number one, integrate into all the programs and services that we're doing? Um, how do I get it done? Then after I get it done, what does it take to manage it? Um, what does it take to maintain it? What companies are you working with that you're plugging into for me to make this work? And then when do I have to regroup them and how much does it all cost as a total package? That's just, in a nutshell, some of the situations. And so I'm looking for this National Science Foundation <laughs> grant to basically help me in two things, me to grow, help me to educate the community to grow, make things easier for the community, and lastly, for us not to just have access to the information, but to create entrepreneurship. If you're getting licenses to create a product on our data, then what's the return? I work for business people. What are the return on investment in dollar and cents to this community? We need more than just knowledge. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, you put so many things out there for discussion, and particularly, I love what you did because you, you demonstrated that the problem is coming, in a sense, from two directions. You know, one, we want more, more community engagement, and so that products reflect community needs, but at the same time, tech companies are just sort of coming from the sky, imposing new things in communities without even talking to the people who need to use these products to create benefits on the ground in their communities. I hadn't really thought about the squeeze that yeah. you're putting on the table. And you know that really brings us uh, to final comments and then broader discussion uh, from Andrew, because he, uh, in his civic hall, uh, hat has really made this extraordinary effort to bring together, I would say, all the pieces of this puzzle uh, to both work and think about these challenges under one roof. So Andrew, if you could tell us about Civic Hall and tell us about some of the challenges the collaborative community is focusing on and engaging in now, that would be great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Corvey. And first I want to say it's a total pleasure to <laughs> yeah, it's a big compliment for you that I picked you. I just realized I picked I picked all women, obviously, didn't I? I'm How did that happen? To be here. I'm, Except I'm, you. I'm smart. I'm just very ha happy to be in this. That's so and funny. It should be the, this all the time, actually. Um, and I'd love to talk about smart cities, and I, you know, can imagine, you know, ones that are equitable and really, truly uh, thinking about uh, making the world better. I'm willing to just simply accept a less dumb city um, because uh, <laughs> we, uh, we constantly uh, are infuriated by the fact that um, what seems obvious and should be fixed or could be fixed uh, more quickly is not. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. But let me tell you a little bit about Civic Hall. So Civic Hall is a collaborative workspace and community of people interested in using technology for the public good. We opened five years ago um, in the Flatiron District. And uh, now we have over a thousand individual members. A hundred organizations have joined, which means government agencies, uh, tech companies, nonprofit organizations, philanthropies, um, and many, many individuals who are applying themselves and the idea that technology can be used for the public good. Um, and we talk about, when we talk about technology for the public good, we talk about smart cities.
issue, and I think it's important to frame it in um, the role that individuals and citizens can play, the role that government plays, and the role that companies play. And one way we like to think about it is that there's a term called civic tech, which we define as any technology for the public good. And then there's gov tech, which is any technology that the government uses or deploys uh, in its service of the public, which very often could be for the public good, but may not be depending upon who's in power. And that word power, I'm gonna come back to in a minute. And then smart city or urban tech, which uh, we've discussed a little bit this morning already, which offers a great deal of promises, but as was alluded to by my fellow panelists, um, there are a lot of questions about who's collecting the data, who's, in, who's designing these systems, where are the biases, and how do we give agency to people over the decisions that affect their lives? And unless you understand those and look at those questions, it would be really easy just to become a cheerleader for the idea that tech can make the world a better place. But unfortunately, tech is actually trying to make the world, uh, in many ways, a worse place. Uh, and for those of us who were very optimistic about technology 20 years ago, um, like Robin and I, when we were you know, sort of talking to policy people, we're sort of now you know, shocked And I'll give you an example um, and, and tie it back to City Hall. So in addition to this physical space that we have, we, about two years ago, we convinced the city of New York to allow us to build a, a larger City Hall, uh, which is currently under construction in Union Square, a 90,000 square foot facility with a uh, much more collaborative workspace, a conference center that will hold about 300 people, and 20 classrooms that would allow people from underrepresented communities to come and be able to get digital skills training and hopefully participate in the 21st century. When the project was announced by the city of New York, it was called a tech hub. Um, because the mayor thought that that would be, make it uh, sexy for uh, his efforts to try to prove that he, he was a visionary around the idea of technology for, for the public. Well, the reality of it is, is that term was actually pejorative. As soon as that was announced, the community <laughs> came out with signs saying, no tech hub. Facebook and Google engineers are gonna move in, take over your apartments, kick out your dry cleaners, kick out your uh, shoe repair places. Um, there's gonna be a Chipotle on every corner. You don't want a tech hub in your neighborhood. Uh, fortunately, through some hard work uh, of our team at Civic Hall, we met with about 80 community groups on the Lower East Side and explained to them what Civic Hall was about. And we actually, in the end, got unanimous votes of approval for this project from the community board from the city council for city planning. But it took about eight months um, because people are generally are aware that technology is not necessarily working in their favor. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One is the fact that on the policy side, and uh, Robin alluded to this, many people in government um, don't understand the technology. I, said, I still can't believe I, most politicians don't know the difference between a server and a waiter. <laughs> it's still true for them. Um, and if you think about how they were missing in action, how public policy were missing in action when, um, when broadband came, when cell phone companies and others started to build broadband networks, um, we now, those systems are now controlled by multinational corporations that we have very little control of. Um, and regulation has not even kept up with that. Yeah. Um, if, if we were having this conversation today in a serious way, we would be talking about libraries becoming ISPs as opposed to um, Wall Street investors building companies and making tons and tons of money. I mean, the average cost of broadband in New York is still about $100 a month, which is beyond the reach of most working class families. And the digital divide isn't just about access to the internet anymore, it's actually the Mm -hmm. And so that's why the piece that I mentioned about training uh, people from underserved communities at Civic Hall and digital skills is so important because unless we bring people uh, from underserved communities to the table, not to review the technology that have already been developed, but to actually build and design them, we're going to continue to perpetuate the biases that we already see in the systems that we have been using for the last you know, uh, 20, 30 years of the way technology is developed. So how many of you have been in an office building where you press a button and they tell you which elevator to get on and you
you get on that elevator? Okay. Obviously, those elevators were designed by men. <laughs> because I would, if I was a woman, I wouldn't want to be stuck on an elevator with a, with a Jennifer Epstein type of character and not be able to get off. And we don't think about things like that. And so very often, you know, we don't realize how these technologies actually in, deploy, in deployment um, are actually very scary. So Barbara mentioned about safe, safe for who? When we talk about you know cameras on the street, initially were you know particularly in London were uh, were actually protested against, and now it's estimated that every single Londoner on the street is actually photographed about three thousand times a day. And when you start thinking about facial recognition technologies, some being produced by companies like Amazon, but being used by governments like China you're starting to realize that the technology is getting so far ahead that we are not going to be able to stop it. So it's even more imperative that we bring people from underrepresented communities to the table in order to create a bull, uh, you know, a bulwark against the, this uh, rapid deployment of technology in ways that are accelerating uh, as opposed to being understood by policymakers or even by citizens themselves. Um, now, there are some great examples of technology for the public good, and some of those technologies can be developed by individuals without waiting for government. So my favorite one is Exit Strategy, which is basically an app that allows you to determine where you should stand on the subway platform so that when you get to the destination, the stairway to get out of the station you're going to is right in front of you. <laughs> you would have thought that would have been designed by the MTA. It was designed by some kids in Brooklyn about five years ago. I love it. I love it. Doing it. Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, and when we, and then there are examples of other uh, platforms like Secret Fix or Just Fix NYC, um, which basically allow people to post problems that they see and then allow others to vote them up or down in order to be able to get attention to them. Um, uh, basically, Open 311. Uh, because why should only government officials be the ones to determine if there's a problem on the street? A um, couple of quick examples of other things that have happened uh, in our community. Uh, more recently is the fact that um, there are challenges not only from the data collection side, but just from the funding side. If I told you that we were going to create uh, civic halls in every single community in America, there'd be new buildings and there'd be places for people to come and collaborate and it would cost a trillion dollars to build, you would say there's no way anybody would fund that, any politician would propose it, or any citizens would pay for it with their taxes. And you're right except that that actually exists. They're called libraries. And they're in every single community in America. And they're underfunded, underutilized, and they're the most important piece of civic infrastructure we have. So um, I'm just giving you a couple of quick thoughts. I've already spoken more than I should have, but um, I'd love to talk to you more about how to create, uh, how to reinvent civic engagement in the 21st century, not as voting or jury duty or committee board engagement, but by making citizens aware about their neighbors, about the data that's being collected about them, and about their lives, and taking responsibility for the decisions that may affect them so that we can shift power from the few to the many. Thank you. Uh, I, there's so much that uh, you all discussed, and we're, of course, running out of time. But before I open it up to the audience for questions, I'd really like to give everybody just an opportunity to comment on some of the issues that were brought up by your fellow panelists or anything else you want to put on the table at this moment. So I'm going to just start with Barbara and just go back down the line again uh, for some uh, observations uh, on these issues. OK. So I would start with a mindset of working from a perspective of <coughs> top down and bottom up and figuring out how to come to the middle. I think that even for myself, and I have to think about this all the time, those of us who do this for a living, we're coming up with all of these ideas and what should happen and what is needed. But then the people on the bottom, or who you're selling to or whatever, they're doing the same thing. They just don't have all the tools you have, but they're trying to figure out how to survive and do better. And what I have found for myself is my best programs actually came with just a little bit of information from somebody at the bottom. I created this whole thing, but then 
because they're living on the ground and they're doing it every day. And so if we could come to where we elevate the value of the, you know, the information from the people on the bottom and figure out how we work on projects from the bottom and the top together and then come up with the middle, we can probably save more privacy and we can also be more effective and get buy-in quicker. Thanks. Kathy? Well, as a technologist, it's, it's been interesting hearing the sort of backlash against um, technology in the field. <laughs> so city here. We love you. We're glad you're here. Um, but um, it's also really interesting to me to hear the different perspectives. And for me, I often see them as um, challenges. So how can we turn around and get the technology to address some of these challenges. So I was particularly interested in some of the things um, Barbara was talking about in terms of um, being given new technology and, and, and people don't know how to use it. Um, what can they do with it? And um, since my interest is in particularly in uh, natural language processing and understanding text and dialogue with people, it looks to me like a real opportunity to, um, you know, hear what uh, the needs of people on the ground and see how we can adapt the technology so, so it better helps people. So although there are problems, I think there are also lots of opportunities and a place like this allows people to come together and hear um, about what the issues are that we need to address. Robin? Sometimes when you talk about data issues, I have friends and colleagues who say it's too late. It's done. And I want to urge us to say, I know that's not the case. So in Europe, GDPR was adopted and has implications here a couple years ago. California just set its new standards for privacy. So certainly we can do this state by state and come up with principles and privacy laws that are pro-individual benefits and that are not pro business or pro-government surveillance benefits, but we really can pull this back. And so um, I think it is, we are, we, we are experiencing a lot of backlash, technology backlash now, so it's great. We have an opportunity to um, put things right, and I'd love to see it at a federal level and not state by state, which, what, which is my, what might happen. And I just want to say, I think there's a huge amount of technology here that's fantastic, but we need to um, be very judicious in individ use of individual data. Andrew? Um, so in, uh, in 1860, uh, Aaron Burr of a water company that had the exclusive rights for the delivery of water to New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> she held for about 20 years and actually built a bank out of the business called Manningham, which became Manningham Bank and now it's Chase Bank. Um, the reason I'm telling you that That's story is fabulous. That it took uh, uh, two, a cholera epidemic, uh, two, a diphtheria epidemic, uh, where 4% of New York City's population died before there was enough demand for the city to break that exclusivity deal and build the water system, the never sink water system that we now have that delivers the fresh water to New York City that all of us benefit from every single day. Um, and the reason I tell you that story is that um, we've given exclusivity to corporations and to um, uh, government uh, entities um, in the same way that we did it then. And people are dying now because of the lack of technology and the biases that are being built into them. And so hopefully, uh, my hope is, is that there'll be enough people working in technology who will realize that they need to change um, what they demand their companies do when they work for them, and that we bring more people to the table to design these technologies in the future who actually understand the implications of the technologies as they're being Thank you. Um, this has been an extraordinary discussion, and I know we could go on way longer. I just want to take some questions from the audience, and since we don't have much time, uh, can, can we have a show of hands so we can do like three questions, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to answer which questions that they want. Hi, Maria. Good to see you. So, otherwise it's a dance. 
Thank you. It's proclaimed from the possibility to understand how the process works. And the second thing that I want to say very shortly is this something that Barbara touched with, and this interoperability. I think that the fact that everyone invents something and is thinks that it is so different from the other that the things don't communicate is a very big problem in technology. And still we went through this years, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it's not understood and not implemented. So it should be something, I don't know which level, it's government, that will say the technology they have to talk to each other. Otherwise we make further silos of so-called science somewhere. Thank you. Let's take another question or point uh, here, and then we'll take the third one. Thank you. Um, why don't I ask all of our panelists to take any aspects of the comments and questions and, and comment slash reply. And we'll start with Robin. I'm just responding to the issue of interoperability. This is key in transportation. Um, I initiated a couple years ago with 10 large NGOs something called the Shared Mobility Principles. And it was a high level principles that would guide cities to create in trans in the realm of transportation to make them sustainable, equitable, and just, I would say. And one of those principles is public public benefits, op public benefits via open data. But as I say those words, and as we crafted them, or was tortured seven months to get everything right, there is this, we need to have open data in order to have interoperability, and in order to have competition within, with, within these silos, but, how much is open and how much is needed to enable that openness. So if I, just straight up the transportation is such an easy example. If I want to have, if I go downstairs with an app and I want to call a taxi, right now I have to call it within Uber or within Lyft or within Cabify or within whatever. And yet if we want people to share taxis, I really want them to be able to interoperate so I can say, oh, someone's doing sh ride sharing with this company via yeah, and I can get you that. Know, Basically, we need an app that does all of them. By saying those words, it means that my trip request would have to be made available to other companies. And so now there's an issue of this privacy issue. So I just want to say that when we go, I'm a believer in interoperability, but we have, we have to be incredibly careful when we say specifically what is open, how much of that data, we talk open data, has it been, is it clusters of five, so I can't choose very specific people. So I, I just wanna say, I agree, and it's a really challenging thing and very delicate to get it just right. Um, Kathy? So I wanna to respond to the last question, which is um, whether um, things are broken when the government gets involved, particularly with regard to privacy or some of the uses of our data. Um, <laughs>
know, there, there are a lot of trade-offs in terms of how our data is being used in ways that we don't even know. So I think the bigger problem is um, how, how do we change things so that there's not so much of a monopoly on who holds the data and what do they do with it. Andrew? Robert already touched on the idea of open data and uh, standardized data, so if I was the mayor, I would certainly try to promote policies like that, but going to the issue of having more people at the table when these technologies are designed, I would figure out ways to force companies that are using the infrastructure of the city to make money to subsidize the public education system in a much larger way to make sure that every single student gets computer science education from the moment they walk into the school at the youngest age possible and that the teachers that are in that school also get computer science training because many of our teachers are, in New York City, for example, one, each teacher gets one day of professional, paid professional development currently. It's, it's mind boggling um, that we're, just, we're still delivering an industrial age public education system in the 21st century. And um, unless we fix that, there's no chance that any of the other ideas could even take hold um, five or 10 years from now. And Barbara. So um, first, Maria, I want to thank you for um, putting a little more teeth into what I was talking about. Maria understands we've done some projects with the Urban Design Lab, and she has witnessed firsthand our pain on trying to move some of this stuff. Um, and then I want to go to the government part. I think, in general, I'm going to accept that government is trying to do the right thing. Let's just start there. You know. You, yeah. Local government or the national government? Global. Okay, let's, let's, I, I have done a little politics, so I know how to maneuver. But the, <laughs> we love you. But the thing of it is, is that I think they struggle from some of the same problems that I have in terms of, they don't understand it. They don't understand it, but there's also an arrogance that they don't need to ask anybody if they're doing deals and making, uh, well, I don't want to use the word deal. They are, yeah, they're doing deals, and they are then working with people who come to them that support them. So one of the lessons I had to learn from my business people, because business people want two things. They want to make money, and they want to meet people to make more money. So <laughs> here I come, but you guys got to give something back. So then finally one of them pulled me aside and said, you can get anything you want from us when you learn how to talk about it in terms of return on investment. Return on investment. So don't come to us talking to us about a social program. Come to me talking about how it's good to do business, or good for a business. So that was a big turnaround for me, but it also made me go to work. I needed to understand more. So I think for us, Government is not going to come up with the solutions. We have to come up with it, and we have to talk to them in terms of how it makes good government. Not, I got a good project for you to do this or to do that, because they're not going to hear it. They're going to hear from whoever is writing the largest check. You know, that's who they're going to hear. And so they have to put that program into place. So learning how government works, how it filters through the process so you can get your project to elevate to the top. You know, and one of the things I use all the time locally, I just do all the work and I call a politician and I say, I got something that's going to make you look good. I need you to talk it up. <laughs> right, Keith? <laughs> that's what you have to do. You do, I'm sure, oh, this is being taped. Oh my God. Anyway, you know, you have to do Speaking the truth work. To power. You have to do the work yourself. It has to come from us. You have to, then you can't elevate it to where it needs to go. They have to do it, and you educate them, and then they have to educate all their agencies. That open data thing drives me crazy. I get Columbia to filter through it just to pull out 125th Street. They need to <laughs> learn how to also be able to put together what they're giving us so the community can use it. Oh, gosh. Thank you all. This has been such an extraordinary panel. And I know everybody's going to walk away thinking and I hope acting on some of the proposals that we've heard today. Thank you again.